I'm uh, editor and writer of uh, 13, of the, of the Gilder Technology Report is what I do. I'm a fellow at the Discovery Institute. I do, um, um, I've written 13 books and my latest book is called The Silicon Eye, which uh, uh, describes a new generation of semiconductors that become very low power, mixed signal, and ubiquitous. They do things, they're sensors, they're um, imagers, they're pattern recognizers, they're tags, uh, they're, and uh, they can be, make silicon ubiquitous. Make the world a beach. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've been asking everybody this general question to start off. What do you see in the future? Well, I, I see the, uh, the internet uh, becoming a kind of neural net. It, uh, you know, the internet already operates as uh, Kevin Kelly calculated um, email at one megahertz, that is a million emails a second. The internet currently transmits about 10 trillion bits a second collectively around the world. And uh, I think that uh, what's going to happen is the core of the internet is going to harden into glass. So the essential center of the internet is going to be fiber optics. It's going to be uh, all optical. And uh, the edge of the net, uh, which is hardware, will soften. Uh, in other words, software will harden in the middle of the net. Uh, now each Cisco uh, router or central office switch has millions of lines of software code in it. All that software will be uh, dissolved in the middle of the net, and uh, so software hardens into glass of fiber optics in the middle of the network. On the edge of the network, hardware softens into various programmable, uh, configurable uh, devices, teleputers, I call them, which are handheld, low power, um, and uh, low power in wattage, but very high power in their ability to uh, perform uh, you know, computing functions. Mm -hmm. How far in the future do you see that? this? This is happening today. It's, it's, it's the general dynamic that governs the evolution of the network today. But as it increases, it becomes the computer itself. The old vision of Sun Microsystems that the network is the computer becomes true in a macro sense. The whole internet itself becomes a kind constantly adapting neural system that uh, is, can be conceived of as a computer that reflects the larger uh, computational process that uh, s some uh, uh, visionaries believe is the universe itself. I mean, that, uh, Seth Lloyd, the MIT physicist, has just written a, book, written a book called Programming the Universe, and uh, it's uh, based on this vision of the universe in some sense being a gigantic processor, you know, which is both uh, analog and digital in various, various dimensions. How, how fast are things changing? Is there an analogy you can use? I, I think, uh, you know, we have the, Things continue to, uh, you know, we have all these Moore's Law factors and, uh, uh, you know, we have the doubling of, semi of computer processing speeds every year or so, uh, the doubling of the number of transistors on a microchip every 18 months, which is a Moore's Law. But, uh, but Moore's Law really is a larger principle of uh, that uh, derives from the learning curve. It's, uh, and the learning curve was uh, defined during the Second World War by the Navy and then developed and applied uh, at the Boston Consulting Group and then at uh, Bain and Company uh, in semiconductors at Texas Instruments, actually. 
and uh, the learning curve propounds that with every doubling of unit volume, accumulated unit volume, um, cost effectiveness increases by 20 to 30 percent. And the real source of the Moore's law is that uh, those volumes of transistors, which are the crucial function in semiconductors, they're transistors, the volumes of transistors grew much faster than doubling every 18 months. They're just constant increase in the experience in building transistors. And, uh, and the result of this extended learning curve is uh, Moore's law. But what really produces accelerating change is not uh, one gigantic uh, Moore's law. Uh, it's not one accelerating exponential. It's the generation of new learning curves. You s constantly starting multiple learning curves. And uh, these come from creativity and invention. And this is, this is the heart of accelerating change is creativity and invention. And it can't be reduced to any set of graphs or any, it's, it's the, it, it is really an effect of emancipating individual human minds because learning is something that happens in individual human minds. So, how, how is new so, the, real, so the real power of the technology is that it's uh, centrifugal. Mm -hmm. the, the, Internet is a giant centrifuge at the middle of the world economy that constantly distributes power to the edges. And, and uh, as individuals get more powerful, that is in their ability to achieve a creative change, uh, the rate of collective advance accelerates and that's the key source of accelerating change. It, it really begins with the centrifuge of the net distributing power on the edge uh, and, uh, and thus uh, emancipating individuals to, uh, to accomplish more innovation and invention. And, that's, and uh, they do it almost paradoxically because uh, with more power, they can reach out to more people, and thus uh, you can have um, a coll t collaborative teams can be much more adaptive, can be formed more quickly, can produce their results um, more rapidly. They can, and uh, so you get lots of learning curves uh, generated as the net expands. How is that expanding net going to change the way people learn? Uh, the expand, the, the uh, key to it is that education today is, has a sort of arterial blockage by uh, great, these educational institutions uh, with all their bureaucracies and parietal rules and, and uh, stultifying kinds of uh, um, disciplinary boundaries uh, and and I think that uh, the key role of the net will be al being allowed allowing people to tap the best information the best teaching wherever it occurs anywhere in the world they're they're not going to be restricted to the sort of um, disciplinary paths that uh, currently encrust all these uh, educational institutions. They can, uh, 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 most of the challenges today uh, d uh, in, uh, intellectually are not mastered by further narrowing of focus, which is the technique that has been uh, dominated education. It's by greater imaginative integration and transdisciplinary outreach and, and, uh, and uh, learning. And, that is, uh, and that's what the internet allows. It allows you to reconfigure fields rather than being confined to, to specific uh, meadows of learning. You're, you're, uh, 
you can reconfigure the domains and, and thus uh, um, make more progress. And also you can adapt the specific, your specific learning program to your own needs and, and abilities, which is another critical thing. I mean, in, in general, uh, you know, the idea of the no child left behind is really a ludicrous model for education. If you really don't want to leave any child behind, you can't educate anybody. You're, you're reduced to the lowest common denominator, which is the opposite of education, which is leading you out. Uh, and uh, education, and, and so this whole um, model of uh, no child left behind really stultifies American education. It's why most of the software is increasingly being done in India, where they leave child, children behind all the time. Uh, and, and, and people who can't really master some particular defined educational path are not aided by being forced to follow it. Uh, they're better off finding out what their real potential is. And so this model of leaving no child behind really is destructive both for the slower students and for the faster ones. It's, it's the opposite of an educational system. And the internet allows you to escape that. It's the long tail in education. I don't know whether you know the long tail concept, but uh, Chris Anderson, the editor of Wired, uh, has, um, has, uh, is writing a book called The Long Tail, which is really based on, um, on uh, the f discovery that Amazon gets more than 60% of its revenues from uh, books below the top 130,000 bestsellers. In other words, you take all the 130,000 bestsellers at, and at Amazon and they only yield 40% of the book revenues. 60% come from books that sell less than the 130,000th book. And this is because when you have a true internet commerce, everybody gets what they want. And, uh, and God made us different. We are all, every one of us is different. And if we define what we want, it's not gonna be uh, like what the next guy wants. It's, uh, you, and uh, the result is this long tail, and it's really dominating internet commerce. You have Amazon, you have Google, which has extended the long tail to advertising. Essentially, Google allows each of us to advertise in an effective way um, to the world. And, uh, and the collective revenues from this advertising model dwarf the lowest common denominator mass broadcasting advertising model. And that is, uh, and because uh, which is based on making people watch ads they don't want to see rather than uh, telling people about products that they want to buy. And that's the, so that's another example of the long tail. The, and it's all derived from this centrifuge of the internet distributing power to the edges where individuals can express their own individual capabilities and aspirations and desires. And that is, that is really the, the um, technological force at the center of the net and at the center of the accelerating changes that are underway in our society. The idea of a singularity is, has been talked about a lot at this yeah. conference. What's your take on that? Well, I think you can define it anywhere you want. Uh, the, I, I'm a, I, my own belief is that Ray Kurzweil, who's written this fantastic book called The Singularity is Near, it is a fantastic book, and, uh, and it organizes all this uh, technological change in, in a very readable and accessible scheme, and the singularity is a critical heuristic in that scheme, 
but my belief is that uh, is that uh, uh, consciousness is not a, a, an effect of quantity or miniaturization or Moore's law or any of these other phenomena. I think information is intrinsically different from uh, physics and chemistry. They are, and uh, that as a matter of fact, uh, Gregory Chaitin, the great IBM uh, uh, fellow who is also the world's leading follower of Kurt Gödel's, Gödel's incompleteness theorem and all this. And anyway, he has he is analyzed the content of physics and chemistry in information theoretic terms. And he finds that there is incredibly little information in the laws of physics and chemistry compared to the huge diversity of uh, information in biology. I mean, it's, and so physics and chemistry cannot explain biology. And uh, they can't, and physics and chemistry cannot explain consciousness, because consciousness is an information phenomenon. And information is separate from its embodiment. It's, it's the central dogma of biology is that the proteins can't shape the information of the DNA. All the influence flows from the DNA information coded in the DNA to the proteins. It can't go the other way around. And, uh, and so, so this means that the information precedes the embodiment. And, and that by no matter of, no amount of studying and mastery of the physics and chemistry in some nanotechnology goal can uh, allow you to understand consciousness, content, information, all these other uh, phenomena. That, that are central to life. Life is about information. That's what differentiates life from other forms, is that, it's, is that it has an information processor. Every cell has uh, uh, hundred bill, hundreds of billions of, uh, of uh, coded uh, of nucleotides that embody uh, an information informational code and that uh, DNA information is separate from its embodiment. If it wasn't separate from its embodiment, it would constantly change as, as physical conditions change, but it doesn't change. Uh, it changes very slowly at the rate of, of uh, mutations, not at some um, much more rapid pace that it would change if, if, if every disruption of the uh, physical embodiment resulted in some change in the programming scheme of the, of the double helix. So that's a, it's, that's a the, the point is that uh, the separation of information from its embodiment, from its incarnation from its physical shape is intrinsic to uh, the central dogma of biology. It's not something arbitrary that uh, we can escape. It's, it's uh, fundamental. And what makes uh, accelerating change happen is because we are, we are in an information economy where we can uh, manipulate information and knowledge in this extraordinarily potent way. And uh, we've uh, broken away from the coils of flesh and blood, in a sense, into this domain where we manipulate um, knowledge. And uh, this is, uh, and, and creativity. And this is the this is the way accelerating change happens. And, and there is an illusion in, I think, uh, I see an illusion of, in uh, some of the uh, singularity thinking that uh, 
that s s somehow changes in, in computer structure or increases in the clock rate of processors or expansion of the bits, bit uh, capacity of memories will uh, all of a sudden reach a tipping point and uh, render the uh, device conscious. And I think that's the materialist superstition. It doesn't, if, it doesn't matter, if you knew the, there's tremendous stress in uh, the singularity on mapping the brain. But if you mapped a computer, if you knew the location of every bit, every atom in the computer, and you, you still would not have any idea what that computer is doing. The compu it's, uh, content and conduit are separate. Information and embodiment are separate. And you can't get the information by studying the bits or, the, or studying the, uh, the atoms or the molecular uh, configurations. They do not yield the content of the thought. And, uh, and it's the content th that uh, embodies the creativity, which in turn yields these uh, exponential curves that uh, constitute accelerating change. So, so I think the singular, I love the book, and I, uh, the singularity is a very, it's a good concept, but I don't think it's, and the general proposition that all these accelerating trajectories of change do uh, yield huge transformations is absolutely true. I do not think, however, that, that, uh, that these computers are gonna be conscious and start uh, outperforming us in some, you know, in, that they will gain intentionality and will and uh, emotional intelligence and, and all these other uh, characteristics that, that Ray implies in, uh, at times in The Singularity is Near. It's a sophisticated book. It's not, it doesn't overstate, uh, but, but there is, I, I detect, a materialist superstition at the heart of the concept of The Singularity itself. Is there anything about the future that scares you? Uh, ever, everything scares you. I mean, it's uh, everything scares you and thrills you. I mean, we're in a, you know, uh, we're encapsulated in this uh, little, um, you know, vessel of flesh that could be flattened by a, a SUV uh, as you cross the street or, or, um, Meteor, or you know, you know. I mean, the world is a frightening and precarious place for us uh, human beings. So, you know, th that peril is constantly with us, and it and it probably can't be overcome by uh, a, a faster clock rate in the next pentium. What haven't we talked about that you think is important? Well, we've talked. You know, I can. You should ask. Question. I mean, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm. I, I think the the key the key point really is because it it gets at the heart of uh, what might be a fallacy in much of the thinking in this in this uh, circle of accelerating change is the idea that somehow information can be reduced to chemistry and physics and and that we. Uh, you know, manipulate atoms at the nanoscale, or t manipulate molecules at the nanoscale. We aren't atoms are tenths of nanometers. Uh, that somehow we will reach a point where, where uh, magically we find mind, and and I I, I don't uh, believe in uh, magic. I, I believe that. Uh, that mind is intrinsically different from matter, and that uh, the idea that there um, can be, that you can get to mind by manipulating matter is an illusion. It, uh, Max Delbruck, uh, the great uh, Nobel laureate physicist, biologist, 
uh, said that uh, seeing uh, scientists attempt to uh, reduce mind to brain reminds him of nothing so much as Baron Munchausen's attempt to extract himself from a swamp by pulling on his own hair. And uh, this is, uh, th this, that all these intellectuals who live in the world of mind and somehow believe it all can be reduced to some uh, chemical or physical uh, primal soup or whatever it is, I think, are, uh, don't understand the world very well. They're, they're Baron Munchausen's trying to pull themselves out of the swamps of ignorance by pulling on their own hair. Okay, great, thank you. Okay.